baby up in the tree here it'll be wonderful if we get a glimpse of it but it's a huge gamble yeah, I don't know if we can just gonna make a high pitch noise to see if we can't get its attention it's a nocturnal primate which is somewhere in the middle of where I'm shining that spotlight now let's try and peep a bit closer Welcome on board a live safari, everyone. Some of you may be joining for the first time. Huge welcome to all of you, to the regulars. Welcome back and really looking forward to the prospects of this morning. We are currently obviously trying to work out where this bush baby has gone, but we've got good news. The Inkohuma Pride was on Juma last night. Well, the bush baby's done a runner. So we'll leave, leave the bush baby to, to its own devices in this wonderful jackalberry tree. I think it's hopped away. Hello, and good morning again. Now I can see you guys. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm teamed up with VM on camera. James is out with Brian on the other vehicle. And like I say, the Inkahuma Pride did come onto Juma last night. We heard them roaring at about 8.30, very close to camp, and headed out and found them on the quarantine clearings. It was just four of them that we saw there, four of the five, and they were very, very vocal. Angie, Kevin, and many others sent through updates. Also hearing them calling, and apparently you also got to see them at the Juma waterhole camera. So, I'm glad some of you got to see them. Now we need to try and work out where they have gone. I see something slipped on the ground here. I think it's a hyena, though. Not the lion we're looking for. Tricky tracking in the dark. Um, so I'm just going to be taking it a bit slowly here. James Richards has just mentioned that he hopes the lions are still in Juma. Yes, definitely. That is what we are hoping. There's also a chance that Tingana has come onto Juma last night. He was heading towards us. So even if they have moved off, maybe he will be around a big dominant male leopard. Now, for any of you who may be joining for the first time, it's important that you know that you can communicate with us. You can let us know your thoughts, questions, comments. And to do that, it's very simple. You can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Hello to Sparkle, who's watching on YouTube. You would like to know what is a bush baby? It is one of these small nocturnal primates. I've got a picture of one here in my book. On the top there. And they are tiny little critters with massive eyes. That's to suit their nocturnal lifestyle. And they've got the ability to be able to spring from a standstill, probably 6 to 12 feet, they can go f rocketing through the air, and that's probably why and how that one managed to escape us getting it on camera earlier. Sparkle, you'll have to keep tuning in, and we'll eventually get one on camera for you, but it is one of the trickier customers for us to be able to get on screen for you. I'm hoping that these lions continue to call a little bit into the morning after hopefully James or myself or another vehicle driving around here will hear them and that way we'll be able to try and fine tune exactly where they are. Well, I did check for their tracks. Um, 
didn't see any sign of them going south from the dam. So I'm guessing they've headed north. So I'm checking up in this direction. James is also in the area trying to work out what's what. So we are jointly trying to track down these lines. got an update through from Linda and thank you very much for this update Linda that there are also some lines somewhere on Arethusa. So the interesting uh, Linda is that audio that you're hearing or have you got confirmed visuals on the Arethusa water or camera please let us know ASAP. And either way uh, it might be worth us heading across there. The tricky thing is that I think it kind of makes more sense for us to search here on Juma initially because if we do find them here then James and I will be able to possibly both be in the sighting together whereas across on Arethusa we can only send one vehicle and there's quite a few vehicles driving around there at the moment so there'll probably be pressure for us to leave which we don't want. Anyway, why don't you go and find out exactly where James is now and hopefully you guys will find the lions. Good morning everybody and welcome onto the Rust Bucket here. We're heading north up on Vubu Road searching out for lion tracks. My name is James Henry. On camera today we have got Brian the Thumb Joubert. Six foot four of him, magnificent human being of course, a fine example of humanity. We are now heading, like I say, hopefully to find some lions. I found no further tracks from the tracks of last night's pride that were yelling their heads off all around us for most of the morning. Now, as Scott has no doubt told you, you are on a live sunrise. Well, we might get a sunrise today. Safari. My name, uh, well, I've told you my name. You, by being live, it means that you should talk to us as often as possible. Hashtag Safari Live if you want to tweet, like some of the dim morning chorus that we can hear, or questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. Otherwise, the Ustream chat, I think, works very well. YouTube chat works very well. Um, whatever you, method you choose, it would be good to hear from you. Ask us about what we're seeing. Ask us about Africa in general. Ask us about traveling to South Africa if you'd like to. We're going to keep driving up this road. The hyena den is to our left, but I'm not going to go in there just now. We're going to see if we can find the lion tracks and where the Inkahuma pride went. And interestingly, I'm sure Scott also told you there were only four of them there last night. Where the fifth one was, I'm not sure. And Leanne said while we were sitting watching them yesterday evening, everyone went out and we had a quick look at them. She said, well, why would they separate? And I originally thought, I had just assumed it would be a fairly obvious answer. And it isn't an obvious answer. I'm not sure why one of them would have separated. Uh, perhaps has gone off to try and seek out the Birmingham boys to mate, perhaps got separated during a hunt, and maybe that's why they were roaring like they were. Perhaps just sort of stayed behind somewhere like one of them did. Apparently three of them moved off at the end of the night and one of them just lay there. So it'd be very fascinating to know if we can find them this morning, how many there are and what the distribution is. Anyway, that is the plan for the morning for now. Ah, yes, of course. Let us not forget, today is the 29th of February. Thank you a very much, Curious One, for saying happy leap day. Yes, happy leap day to you too. And remember, ladies, this is your day to ask men to marry you, apparently. That, of course, is a ridiculous tradition. Any day is just as good as the other for a lady to ask a man to marry him. Normally, we're just too scared to do it ourselves, you see. Slight pinkening of the horizon. Look, Brian, maybe your time lapse will be okay. Brian's put out a GoPro camera to take a time lapse, and you can see a little bit of pinkening of the sky. That's actually really pretty with the blue shining through there. We've had no sunrise and no sunset for the last four days, which, of course, to many of you would be very distasteful if you came to Africa, but to us, a real joy given the blinding heat of the current summer. We're staring down the barrel of a very hot week this week. I think then it'll start to gently dip down towards the autumn. 
The trees, of course, have gone autumnal long before the time they normally would, and that's because of the lack of rain. <laughs> Hello, monkey, monkey. Oh, what's that? It's a darker. Monkey man? Um, just before I answer your question, monkey man, let's just have a look at this dica. I've managed to find 47 dicas yesterday. This one, of course, has now disappeared. Oh, very um, sneaky, that dica, wasn't it, Brian? I didn't see it at all. Oh, it was in there. It was under that little bit of bush there that you pointed the camera at. Anyway, it's gone now. Monkey Man, you will say, can I find you a rock python? I'd love to find you a rock python. I find them the most fascinating snakes, largely because you can pretty much interact with them without them trying to stick nasty amounts of venom into your body, which is a great advantage. So I would really like to find an African rock python. Beautiful, beautiful snakes. And I will do my best to do so. You also want to know if we get trumpeter hornbills here. We don't as a rule, but they do come through from time to time. So every so often you'll hear that plaintive cry, and it sounds almost like a, a baby's wail. If you've ever heard a trumpet or hornbill calling, that's what it sounds like. In fact, let's go on to the cut line rather so we can see the tracks more clearly. And Monkey Man, you'll find that they'll pop through every so often. They'll settle, especially if there's a sort of fruiting tree or two. They'll settle for a couple of hours and then they'll move on. But normally, they like to be where there's water on a river or in a more forested area than we have here. So the four hornbill species we get here would be the red bill, the yellow bill, the gray hornbill, of course, and the ground hornbill. Then every so often, you'll get a crowned hornbill that'll come through. And then every so often, even more rarely, you will get a trumpeter hornbill that comes through. And for those of you who don't know, a trumpeter hornbill, it looks like our standard issue hornbill, except black and white. You can tell definitely that it's a hornbill, but it's got a very big cask, which is the top part of the um, top bill. And it's a sort of echoing mechanism, apparently, that helps their call to travel miles and miles. Thank you, monkey man. Good question. I think that's Scott behind us. I'm just going to keep checking along the road here to see if the tracks of those lions came out. Of course, we got going quite early this morning, and so I didn't see anything in the way of tracks. There's some impala who are running away from me, as all mammals have done for the last four days. Now, this one is having his morning constitutionals before running away, and he's just doing a few loosening up exercises before getting on with his day. This is important. Oh, he's limping, actually. Look at that, Brian. He's going to be toast fairly soon. I think that was limp or just stiffness? That was definitely limp. Back left, definitely a bit stiff and sore. Shame, I wonder what happened to him. Hmm. Now, a question from Jamie Mack, I think was the name or Jamie Mac, I can't hear exactly. I don't know about the large pride seen on Nkoro. I'm not sure which one you're referring to. I know yesterday that the Styx pride, three females and three Birmingham boys were found on vessels, which is just near Nkoro. Um, but I don't, didn't hear of any large pride there. So please would you tell us what you mean? Um, it would be very interesting. I can only assume if it isn't the Styx pride or a section of the Birmingham boys, then it must have been some pride that came in from the Kruger Park. So that would be fascinating to know. So please let us know. I have found no tracks at this stage. And I just wonder where those lines went. I have a sneaky suspicion they headed back to the west towards Arethusa, possibly to fetch their lost cohort. Now, lions roaring like they were last night are basically giving you an indication that they are being territorial. So they call territorially. They don't call for the purposes of calling, and they certainly wouldn't have been on the hunt. And it also means that if they're marking territory, if they're checking out where they can f sort of um, mark their boundaries, they will move a pretty big distance. So it'll be interesting to see if they're still actually on Juma or if they've gone off elsewhere. 
right on their western boundary yesterday being and northern boundary being at Simbambili. Hope and hold thumbs all of front by front. Pigs, pigs yeah, coming up. Pigs coming up. Uh, behind you. Um, not too sure where to go from here. That's so cool. Look at those little warthogs. We had them coming out of this termite mound last night. But they don't like to be in the termite mound when you're close by. For some reason, it's not a source of um, protection for them. It's far more a source of, I think, warmth. They're very sensitive, they don't have fat reserves, so they do get cold in the night, and I think that's why they're in those burrows. But as soon as they get threatened, they come speeding out. Now, that termite mound was housing two sows and five little babies. How they all fit in there, I mean, that's a tiny little mound. <laughs> I'm just going to get hold of Scott on the radio. There you go, He's just giving Craig an update. All right, copy. I'm going to just check east and I'll come make my way and give you guys a hand. All right, let's okay. carry on. <laughs> Scott, I was just going to check towards the Bullshit Dam. Uh, not the horse of dams that he's down from here. Copy. So we're just going to circle the area, travel all the roads here, and just see if we can't find some tracks of the lions crossing hither and yon. Linda, we will answer your question with a visual aid. Brian, would you point to the camera at a piece of green grass? Linda, you are in Washington, Lakewood, Washington. Look, there it is. You wanted to know if green grass was coming up? There it is coming up. That is two days of growth, just two days. Isn't that amazing? That two days ago was the brown sort of golden color that you can see underneath the leaves. And so the grasses have come up, but you can see that leaf litter on the ground is not normal for this time of year. And while the grasses have recovered to some extent, you'll find I don't think that the trees are going to recover. <laughs> that one's definitely not going to recover. It's very dead. <laughs> that one does not suffer so much from the drought as from being ripped off a tree by an elephant. waving at Scott Dyson, who's behind us. It would be great ignominy, ignominy if I were to drive over the lion tracks, not notice, uh, as he came up behind me, and then he was to say, oh, but the lions have crossed here. So I shall stare intently at the ground. I don't see any tracks. It's not necessarily a bad thing. We don't want to see them crossing out of Juma. We want to see them staying here. But because Juma is relatively small in comparison with the Lion Pride's territory, we do need to sort of traverse the boundary to see what's going on. The average Lion Pride in this area probably has a territory of about 6,000 hectares. Now that's Juma and Arethusa combined of 1,500 hectares. So we're looking at four times, or about a quarter the size of a full lion territory. So it's not, wouldn't be surprising that were those lions to be marking territory, which they certainly were when they were calling last night, it wouldn't be surprising to find them having crossed out to go and patrol another part of their territory. That said, they may have fallen upon some kind of unaware antelope or unaware zebra and it'd be eating that somewhere. It would also be exciting. Well, not the zebra, of course. Oh, very nice update there from Deb in Ohio. 
Thank you, Deb. You say there were eight mainless, so you're assuming lionesses, on a coral yesterday evening. That is really interesting. Thank you for that. I wouldn't know what's happened to them, I'm afraid. We've had nothing on the updates on our WhatsApp group. And at the same time, we are not unfortunately in radio contact with Nkoro. The guys from Cheetah Plains, which are just next door, will keep us posted on anything like that. <laughs> Hello, Clown Sharon. Clown Sharon, you want to know if lions have got a, a typical or recognizable odor that can be used to track them? No, Clown Sharon, not to our noses. There's no question, though, that animals can smell them. I thought for a while that they were fairly odorless, but I've watched now their potential prey. As soon as the wind changes and they become aware of the scent of the lions, their prey definitely reacts quite strongly. So yes, they do have a scent. It's too weak for us as human beings to follow. I think you could definitely, you could follow them with dogs. With trained dogs, you could definitely follow lions. But absolutely, they use the winds. And we watched the other day, Scott was tracking the Nkuruma pride as they stalked a herd of buffalo, or two buffalo bulls, not really a herd, so much as a pair of friends. And there's no question that they came around the wind to specifically use the wind. The wind was blowing in from the southeast and they moved around the buffalo, came in from the northwest, and the buffalo were totally unaware of them until there was a slight change in the wind and suddenly you could see the buffalo look up and sniff. So yes, they can definitely smell them. But as you say, their horrifically stinking scats are the most distinctive kind of smell that there are. Now, Kathy, on the subject of tracking, a very nice question. Can we see their tracks and follow them over grass and rocks and other debris? I just thought I had a smell of scat there. Kathy, um, I am particularly not particularly good at doing that sort of thing, but yes, very experienced trackers absolutely can. You can tell just from the way the grass is lying. It does depend. I mean, if you can't track it across bare ground or across a, a bare rock. You will never be able to track a lion, for example. But very experienced trackers will be able to follow lions and leopards through this kind of um, landscape because they, they do leave very slight scuff marks as they go and you can do it. There are some conditions in which you can't, of course, but uh, through this landscape, as experienced trackers will be able to hopefully follow tracks of lions and leopards. Okay, let's go across to Scott, get an update from him. I'm gonna check the dam here and then head further south. Well, tracking lion at this st stage of the morning is not easy because we don't have lights, so I know you guys have been discussing with James the different substrates. The moment the hardest thing for us is the fact that there's no sunlight coming in at a low angle casting shadows on whatever tracks there may be. It is turning out to be a beautiful morning though and this view you wouldn't have got with James out to the east. He's been heading in a westerly direction there. You can see the sun's having a bit of an effect on those clouds but there's a thick bank that the sun is going to have to burn through before it can assist us in the tracking. Hello Mary in New York, you are coming to stay at Arethusa in September, that's wonderful news and you must be very, very excited. It's a great, great time of the year to be coming um, in general, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens regarding the drought. Either way, it's a nice time of year to be here. And yes, you'll definitely be able to meet up with the crew. Um, I would say just maybe a month or so before you, you come out, maybe just uh, pop a reminder to the final control room that you'll be coming and they will put you in touch with the necessary people to coordinate that plan. Um, but now, because it's so far away, you don't have to worry about too much. But yes, 
you'll definitely be able to come across and check out the crew. Basically how it works is uh, you'll come before your afternoon drive, get to meet our crew just before we depart, go into the final control room, see a little bit of what's happening there as we do our pre-flight checks and maybe watch the initial part of the drive before continuing on your own safari. So that's usually how we do it. Mark, you would like to know what is the meaning of triple M? And I'm not too sure, but it's just one of the main roads that basically runs between Juma and Arethusa. What could the meaning be? about Mala Mala. Malamala. Mala. Mala, Mala main road, yeah, that makes sense for him. There's a property to the south of us called Malamala, Mala, and maybe it was the Malamala Mala main road uh, at one point. Now it's an access road to many of the camps. to know how do new prides of lions form and um, basically what will happen from time to time is a large pride will split up into smaller smaller prides sometimes even small prides split up into groups of two i mean there's there's no set rule as to how a new pride will be formed like i say sometimes mega prides have portions that branch off and sometimes even small prides of four or five six females will split up but generally they tend to kind of stay as a core natal group that new lions keep getting born into into a certain area but occasionally there are splits or breakaways but like i say there's absolutely no set formula to how and when that should happen I guess again a lot can be you know a lot of the animal related questions that are asked to us can be related to humans and it's the same as saying i guess what will cause different tribes or different communities to to form out of a bunch of humans and sometimes it may be like i say if one group of humans or one village becomes too large it may make sense for certain people to move off and start another village or it could be that there's a small village that simply has some politics and some people want to go elsewhere or maybe no politics but just different chain you know thought processes as to where they should go or what they should do so a lot of the time when you ask questions ask yourself what would humans do and a lot of the time it will actually answer the question in Canada, I wish there were black leopard or black panthers here on Juma. Uh, I don't think one has ever been recorded in the Saabi sands, but it is important to know that in certain parts of South Africa and Africa as a whole, black or melanistic leopards are seen from time to time. I don't think I've ever seen a photograph of one in the wild though. So, even though I've heard all these rumors that they exist, I've never seen a picture on a camera trap or any confirmed sightings of colleagues of mine. So I've got no reputable sources, but according to some fairly reputable sources, I guess they have apparently been seen. It's not by me or anyone that I know that I can rely on. However, there have been some confirmed sightings of leucistic, so the opposite to melanistic, which is the dark form, there have been confirmed sightings of pale form leopards, also known as strawberry leopards. Where have these lions gone? to Ava, who would like to know if the ladies will ever call out in the hope that they will attract males to them. Yes, certainly. Again, just like humans, um, we'll 
women sometimes shout out in the hope that they will find men? Yes, and will they sometimes just chat amongst themselves and other groups of ladies? Yes, that's their form of communication, Roaring, so yes, they will sometimes be calling the males, sometimes be telling females, sometimes females within their own pride where they are. I'm guessing that's what actually happened last night because there was only four out of the five lioness here. I did see one lion track coming down this road, but I think this is possibly on their way into Juma last night. We saw them just up ahead of us on the road here, and they were calling just up to the right of us on the quarantine clearings. try and work out where they have gone from here, not how they got here. Hi Gabby on YouTube, you would like to know where will the herbivores seek refuge at night? And it's in large open clearings like this one on our right. An open area is the safest place where you could possibly be. Go ahead, James. Scott, I'm now doing Impala Plains Road or Impala Road. Any updates also? No negative. Um, um, came down Gallagher shortcuts. I'm going to check onto Philemon's cut line to see if they didn't sneak south of us. Okay, cool. So just uh, communicating with James there, uh, which is important so we know who's checking where and what's been checked so far. Um, so yes, large open clearings are the best places for prey animals to sleep at night. The reason being is that it is very difficult for predators to creep up on them if they are out in the open. No structure to hide behind. So this clearing, if you drive through it at night, it's actually phenomenal. It's like a big city. Whereas if um, you come here in the morning, already the animals have moved off. But there were hundreds and hundreds of animals lying here last night. Interestingly, even though the lions were calling nearby, the prey animals were all, you know, relaxed as they normally kind of would be lying even if there weren't lions nearby and that kind of makes sense it wouldn't be logical for a prey animal to hear a lion roaring nearby which essentially is telling the prey that they are busy doing other things not really hunting because they're giving away their position but also why flee from the known into the unknown when you can stay relatively calm knowing okay there's lions calling nearby obviously keep an eye out for them but it's fascinating to just see the animals continuing with their evening rest, unperturbed by lions calling so close by. Hello, Joel, in New York, also on the topic of predators sneaking up on their prey like to know or confirm that the drought is obviously beneficial for predators yes because their prey becomes weak sometimes just falls over and they don't even have to run after it they can just walk up to it and feed on it so yes their prey will be a lot easier to catch and consume as they become weak without food oh this is a beautiful view let's have a look here while i continue Joel. and you'd like to know if it's more difficult for them to sneak up on their prey yes it is i guess so even though there's not as much vegetation and cover. Um, look at how awesome that is. Which does make their lives a little bit more tricky. I think on the whole, it is going to be an easier time for them. I mean, a lot of the vegetation, especially in the Sabi Sands, there's, it's thick, it's just varying degrees of thick. It's not as thick as it would be in the summer, but there's still a, a plenty of cover, especially when hunting under the cover of darkness for the predators to sneak close enough up to their prey. Hello, Tammy. I'm very 
happy to hear that you enjoyed the Instagram picture that I, or video rather, that I shared last night of those Inkohoma lioness roaring. It was absolutely wonderful. It's one of the best things that you could hope to experience is lions roaring. And I haven't heard the Inkohoma lioness roaring that much, so very special memories for me last night. going to continue on our search to try and establish which direction these lines are headed and once we work that out it's going to become considerably easier to work out what's going on. For now though you guys are going to head south and west of us to where James is checking. Good luck. Up ahead, a storm seems to be brewing in the far west, but we don't seem to have any kind of rain predicted for the day. That said, of course, as we know, the weather predictions of the area are generally to be as believed as the politicians of this fine land in which we find ourselves. Politicians in any land, to be honest. Right, we have come down a pace called Impala Plains. You can see a vast plain set out before us, and that is covered in a swathe of green grass, also just two days old. And we had a question about the green grass earlier, and yeah, here it is. And there is a crowned lapwing. The crown lapwing will be very excited because he's found some termites. You see him there? Watch him eating the termites. Come on, lapwing. Don't let me down. Eat a termite. Now, the lapwing's structure is very clever, especially this one. He has no back foot. And that's because he is a runner. He's a courser. See, he runs after his prey. A few steps, tips over, eats a few steps. And because, oh, there's another one. And he'll be running around today. Because of the rain, there will be an emergence of insects. I think there's going to be some warmth today, so there will be even more insects, and that will make all the insect eaters like him very happy. And the one fascinating thing about, I think, about the crowned lapwing is that he is very closely related to shorebirds, the plovers that live on the shore, or the wading birds that live on the salty seashore and because of that he's got this amazing gland just above his nose through which he exudes salt and what that means is that he's completely independent of water he can survive without water as long as he's got enough insects to eat he can exude the salt from his body through that special salt gland that's why you find them in deserts and very dry areas like we currently find ourselves in He's called a kivit in Afrikaans. And that's an onomatopoeic word. Well, there we have a magpie shrike. Hello, Anne in Australia. You've been keeping all sorts of lists while, since you've been watching. And you've been watching us for two weeks. And I think you say you've got, I'm just going to ask for the numbers again. You've been keeping a mammal a reptile and a bird list, 19 mammals, 12 reptiles, and 62 birds in two weeks, I'd say it's a pretty good return. Well done, Anne. Please keep going with all that. I'm especially interested to see how big your reptile list will get. I'm hoping also that you'll keep an amphibian list fairly soon. And with any luck, after this rain, we'll be able to increase your number of amphibians. In the last two weeks, I've only seen one amphibian, and that was a painted reed frog. Stunning frog. Now, the magpie shrike has a fairly what we call Catholic diet. That means that it will eat pretty much anything that is made of wheat. Like most shrikes, it has a little toothed bill. They'll eat anything that they can, from insects, probably to small hatchling birds, if they can get hold of them. And the rest of the flock, they do occur in a flock, will be around here also foraging. And I think this clearing is experiencing something of an emergence of insects. And that's why this activity is here. I'm just going to be quiet for 10 seconds. And I want to listen out to just to see perhaps if those lines are calling again. And also to the subdued nature of the current dawn chorus.
And there you have it. You see how quiet it is. Just the old horn boogie. In the background. 102 drongos going in the distance. A southern grey hornbill, but way away. It's very quiet dawn chorus, typical of this particular year. This particularly dry year. Anyway, I love the sight of a grey horizon like that. It does bring a certain sense of promise with it. Now we are driving through a clearing here, and Stefan and Sparkle, you're uh, after a fairly large bird, you say, do we get ostriches here? Yes, you may find them in a clearing like this. They're very unusual in the Sabi Sands. I have seen one or two, though, and they do occur naturally in the Kruger Park. They do like open areas, though. They won't like to be in woodland, because, of course, they cannot run away from things that want to eat them in woodland. And astonishingly, their major predators out here, of course, are lions. It's just kind of incongruous thinking of a lion trying to take down an ostrich, I find, but that is what would eat them. They're not that common out in the Kruger Park, but they are certainly around the place. Much more common in the Cape, in the drier Karoo regions. They're very good in the desert, or semi-desert, are ostriches. The other thing, the reason we're down in this particular area, apart from just checking if the lions have perhaps crossed west, we're now on the western fringes of Juma, is to see if Tingana didn't come east he was just over there yesterday inside Arethusna. Apparently, when he was last left, he was heading in an easterly direction. So we'll get an update from the Arethusa guys when we can as well. And you can see we're driving very slowly, just keeping an eye out on the road for any tracks that may cross. Oh. There, 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 there. Here is a, a terrapin. The water's relatively clear, so we might be able to have a look at him and see whether he's got those tentacles that a marsh terrapin is supposed to have underneath his chin. <laughs> and he'll be waiting for something to come and drink, be it an invertebrate or perhaps a very small bird. And he'll grab it and pull it under the water like a miniature crocodile. Now, Kim B, completely unrelated, of course, to the watching of this terrapin, wants to know how long lions can give birth for, at what stage they stop giving birth. Well, basically, they can give birth, like most animals here, until the day they die. Very few animals will go through a stage of menopause. We, as human beings, are relatively unique in that regard. I think you'll find elephants go through a similar, similar phase. But species where learning is not required, this chap's coming very close to us. Isn't he cool? Have oh, you lost him? Mm. <laughs> I just don't want to move. And as Leanne has just noticed, which I wasn't noticing, it's eating the wings of the flying termites. There he is. Isn't he cool? Now, just for those of our viewers in the United States, I know that you don't, you'd use a different term for turtles and tortoises and that sort of thing. This is a terrapin, and it would be basically defined as a freshwater turtle. A turtle we would define as a chelonid that lives in the sea. And then a tortoise, of course, is a land-dwelling chelonid. Right, gone. Beautiful. Really nice terrapin sighting there, Brian. Mm, well done. Good job. Mm -hmm. The lion now, please. Okay. Yeah, or a leopard. Okay. Not fast. Either one. There we do see the lightening of the horizon, which is quite nice. We're going to have quite a pretty day ahead. It's always lovely when the cloud breaks up the sun out here. TV stain on YouTube. You want to know if the safari live guides 
uh, guide tourists as well. Um, well, some of us do. Brent has actually just taken a safari. He was on leave and he took a safari actually out of Vuyatela. Um, we've all used to, well, no, that's not true. Jamie used to work at a, um, she has a more conservation background rather than a guiding background, but she has guided a few tourists. Uh, Brent and Scott and I did a lot of guiding in our pasts. And do we still do it? Well, I mean, yes, if somebody was to engage us in, a, in our private capacities as a private safari guide, we probably would, but no, not as a matter of default. I certainly find this current job much more rewarding than doing a standard issue safari guiding job. I think that it has a limited, it has a limited shelf life for a lot of people. There are very few people who can maintain um, a, an attitude that is conducive to safari guiding as a career. They're very, very special people and I've met maybe two or three in my life who every time they meet a new person, and I'll explain the difference between what we do and what's in safari guiding, and I know it's kind of similar, but it isn't. Um, you as a safari guide, you meet say six people every three or four days, and every three or four days, just getting it up very quickly. So every three or four days you meet new people, and for them, it's a, it's a journey of discovery. It's new people coming out to your country to see your spa space, and it's a new thing. And they will ask you almost the same questions every single time. And there are very few people, and they are very special people, who are able to then maintain that enthusiasm for the same questions and to enjoy and revel in the moment of discovery that their new guests have. And like I say, uh, most of most safari guides only last sort of two or three years before they then move on to something else. Now the difference between what I do and what a safari guide does is that we have a conversation with a much larger group of people. Lots of those people are with us often, which means that you can have a much more in-depth conversation about the wilderness. Um, but at the same time, you do get new viewers who come in and they ask these incredible questions of discovery, if you like, which I do just find so refreshing but because the audience is that much bigger I find the conversation that much more stimulating and also to meet people on a daily basis you know three or four new people every day if you happen to be slightly introverted which means that you draw your strength from within you as opposed to from without you um, it can become very tiring indeed and that's why you'll find safari guides move on to other things they go into conservation perhaps or they go into lodge management or they go back to the city and become bankers which of course is a appalling option or they become um, safari guides for safari life which is an amazingly stimulating activity for six hours a day so that in a long-winded way is a way of saying yes we do take safaris every so often but not permanently no <laughs> Jim Butler, <laughs> nice question on Twitter. You say, what is the question that we get most often? I'm going to split that into as a safari guide and then as a as a presenter. Well, it's probably the same thing. I think common, I can't give you the exact one, but most common questions, what's the most dangerous situation you've ever been in? Um, what's the most incredible sighting you've ever had? And... Yeah, those are the two most common questions, in fact, of any safari guide and any, in, in fact, on Safari Live as well. I think those are the most common questions, uh, often about the danger of the area. And I think it's a, it's a danger in many respects to a lot of people translates into the romance of what we do here. So I think those are them. And then what's the question that I, I wish I would be asked? Um, Jim, I don't know. I think that the Safari Live questions have normally been questions that you didn't used to get on Safari. Really interesting kind of questions, in-depth questions about different aspects of the ecology. And because it actually generates, sometimes some of these questions generate a conversation amongst the viewers themselves, that feeds back through to us. And so most of the stuff that we discuss, or that I want to discuss out here, we can. I can generally turn the conversation to what I feel like talking about, which is excellent. 
wonderful light coming through the clouds. Brian, I take it back. I think your time lapse will be a beautiful one today. Stop nodding knowingly. Susie R, I've got some kind of an explanation from you about, here's some zebra, let's just have a look here, about turtles and terrapins, and you say in the southern states you call turtles terrapins, and then there's something about a gopher, which I didn't quite get, oh, you call turtles and terrapins gophers, well that's an interesting thing, I thought a gopher was some kind of a subterranean uh, rodent as made famous by that classic film. Brian, what was it called? Mm. Caddyshack. Mm. If you haven't seen it, you should. Utterly ridiculous, utterly hilarious. Right, this is not a Caddyshack show. There are some zebra. Their bottoms in full, glorious sunlight. Of course, these are the most magnificent bottoms that we get to see out here. Well, they're not, Brian. Look they at them. Fantastic. Rounded strong and stripy, and stripy. <laughs> I just love it when the light like this is diffused through the clouds and you get the suddenly the land from being totally flatly lit explodes with a sort of golden light and then it covers over again and I just find it so exciting zebra there having a nice graze on the green grass and you'll see that they're eating quite long grass and they are long they're known as long grass feeders and so they'll often precede other grazers like wildebeest and impala which will come through an area after the zebras have and there's an interesting bird calling there can you hear it it's a bzz, 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 bzz. i can't see we i don't think we're going to be able to identify it into the sun there i think it's a bunting no, it's not. Can you hear it? It's not. You can hear it. Oh, there it goes. Oh, it's behind us. It's behind us. You still see it? Yeah. And pin painter, while we're looking at this bird, you want to know if a magpie shrike is also known as a long tail shrike. It used to be, yes. that's behind the leaf. I can't identify it. I've got no idea what that was. It seemed like a cesticular. If you don't mind, everyone, I'm going to reverse because I can still hear it calling. But for those of you who are keeping a bird list, this might be a good one. I don't know what that is. Tiny cesticular-sized bird. There it is. See it, Brian. There, 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 there. Oh, it's flown off again. It's in this giant Balanites tree, Nicholas' favourite tree. It was making a sunbirdish type call as well. Huh. Oh well. I don't know, everyone. That would have been really fascinating. Actually, quite a lot of bird activity going on here. We've got the kingfishers, some helmet shrikes, and that very strange call. Hmm. Wonderful. Okay, on we go. The big bottoms of the zebras are still feeding off into the woodland, so we'll carry on down here. better and better, don't they, Brian? <laughs> New viewer with the name Pup Equality. I'd love to know where that, come, where that comes from. Uh, Pup Equality. I'm not laughing at your question. I'm laughing at your slightly um, interesting name there. Pup Equality. Mm. Uh, equality for the pups. Viva. 
Um, <laughs> you want to know what the silliest situation I've ever been on safari is? Um, or as a safari guide, or there's some giraffe. As a safari guide, or as or on safari, the silliest situation. I'm not sure what my silliest situation is, to be honest. I'm sorry, Brian. I I'm going to give it some thought. I'm just going to show you that we have seen some giraffe in the distance. And as we look at them and see if they come any closer, we'll listen for some lions. Let's head across to Scott. He's got something else to show you. No, it's not easy to see, but there is a hyena. There it goes, moving through some very thick bush. We are on our eastern boundary here. It should pop up into another little clearing there. There it goes. And wouldn't it be nice if we could have a chat with that hyena and ask it about its evening, what it got up to, what predators it saw, how many leopards it came across, where it thinks the lion may be. Sadly, we can't, though, but at least we did get to see it. This is the eastern boundary of Juma. I've spread my search party far afield, and I'm essentially going to work my way back in from our perimeter, trying to just work out where these lions have gone. Saxon and Aubrey, two of the Juma guides, have just got out. They've got trackers on their vehicles perched on the hood. And track set east from the Gallagher waterhole. And we've looped yeah. through that area, no further sign of them. Good morning, good morning. Uh, so, just been up there for you. I've uh, barely even touched uh, in the sands back just across the Weird Teller. Oh, good heavens. One night camp. The wild dogs are oh, no, on you. Juma. They've just yeah, crossed uh, in. Yeah, uh, the so, I'm sadly on the wrong side of the property, but James is on the correct side. Um, right in our northeast, uh, uh, northwestern corner of the property, the, the pack of Croston, it's the Sands Pack. And isn't that awesome news? So, James is going to be dropping the clutch and hurtling in that direction. And I'm sure Texan and Aubrey are also going to head in that direction. So I don't think we will. There's going to be quite a lot of vehicle traffic there, so we'll continue trying to search for the lions for the time being. We'll maybe join up with James a little bit later, though, because wild dogs do move so quickly, though. Very hard to keep up with, and the more vehicles in the area, the more chance you have of staying with them. As I was saying, though, before we got that awesome radio update, There have been tracks found of the Nkuma lioness. They're heading east, and we have checked around. No further sign of them. They could be in one of the large blocks in that area. Maybe they've made a kill successfully and are busy chewing it on it. And they haven't maybe moved as far as we would have thought. Or maybe they've just been moving over portions of road that are very hard and difficult for us to see their tracks on. Hopefully, time will tell, and we're going to work out where they've gone. The problem we face now is that everyone who was initially looking for the lion has given up and they're racing towards the wild dog. Anyway, good prospects. to know which, which is the last or most recent large African predator that has gone extinct. Hmm. I, I don't have uh, the foggiest idea what that could be. Last large African predator to go extinct. I'm drawing a blank there, Mark. Apologies. Not sure if anybody else knows the answer to that question. If they do, I'm sure they will share it with us. What I do know is that it's the wild dog and cheetah that are the most 
endangered at the moment out of the large predators that currently exist. Ethiopian wolf is another one. I, th I think they're in serious trouble. There's been a recent rabies epidemic in the Simeon Mountains. They're also called the Simeon wolf. So I think there are about four or 500 of those left in the wild and they've lost a large portion of that population in the last year or so to rabies. So they're in trouble, but in terms of one that has actually gone completely extinct, I don't know. Hi Robin, you would like to know what is my favorite time of the day to head out on safari? And it's first thing in the morning. The thrill of the unknown of what's happened the night before is what really gets me excited about the morning. Um, the afternoon, there's kind of less unknown. You kind of got a better idea of what you are likely to find, especially regarding the predators who are not as active during the day as they are at night. So that thrill like this morning of not knowing what's going on, getting a report that wild dogs have just come onto the property, trying to work out where the Inkuhuma lioness are, seeing if there's any leopard tracks around. That is something that is not likely to happen in the afternoon. So I prefer the morning for that reason. Just jumping out here quickly to make sure there's no tracks I've been missing. This is a bit of a highway for leopard and for lion. Okay. Um, well, the lion are now spoken for. They have crossed north into Buffalo's Hook according to their tracks. So we can stop worrying about looking for them. And we too will now join in. Okay, we need to send you to the dogs quickly. Okay, false alarm, sorry about that. I'm told is on his wild dogs. I'm not sure where they are or what they're doing, but he's on his way there. So that's good news. Hopefully he will get there before they disappear. Although maybe I'm hearing a broken down telephone. Maybe I thought I heard Texan saying that the lion tracks have crossed north. But maybe it's that he's found the wild dog yeah, crossing yeah, north. There we go. Dogs, everybody. Dogs, dogs, dogs. Just sleeping here. They're just... <laughs> okay, we arrived here and we thought they were... <laughs> We thought they were going to cross north. I think they may still cross north, but they've just lain down here in the clearing. Whew. We drove here at a substantial speed. This is so exciting. My favorite, favorite thing to be doing in the bush at the moment is looking at wild dogs. Ryan, is your, is your spinal column still intact? Barely. Is it shorter than it was before? Yeah, a little bit compacted. Isn't this fantastic? So they came across, we had word that they came running across from Arethusa, uh, from One Eye Pan, which is a water hole on Arethusa. I assume they were chasing something because they got here very quickly. They arrived in this clearing and have gone to sleep. Right, we're just going to move. We will also be using, probably using the VR rig. So if I start pointing things out left and right and you can't see them, uh, don't worry about that. Oh, you tell me when you're recording on that thing, will you?
incredible sighting here. On the left, one dog, a male. Looks like the alpha with his torn ear to try and identify which pack this is. And then to the front and right, you can see two others on the ground and further to the right, another. Just walking through the clearing, obviously trying to pick up the scent of something. I can't see how many there are in total. And obviously to the far right, the sun just peeping through the clouds. Above us, a beautiful steel gray sky. Here comes the dog now. Looks like the alpha male. I don't think this is the Investic pack, though. Isn't this magnificent? Look how close he is. He's only about maybe three meters from us. <laughs> now, I don't know which pack this is. I'm going to guess that it is the Sands pack, simply because I don't see all 12 members of the Investec pack. And this chap, uh, the Alpha in the Investec pack, has got a mangled ear, but I've only got two mangled ears. Here they go. They're moving now. They're on the move. Probably going to cross to the north, but let's follow them anyway. Keep looking to the left. There's another game driver, obviously. And two dogs in front, the male in front of us, and then in front of that, and the one. There, straight underneath. It just looks straight in front of us, underneath the tree there. There's another one lying down. Three to the left, one in front, one further in front, and one then in the center. So we've got four actually to the left. And Linda Grave, you agree with me. You say this is the Sands pack. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One of them's got an injury there. The Nick on the shoulder, you can see the one on the in front of that little group. Looks like a youngster. A pup from this year. And they look to be crossing north now, unfortunately. Oh going into Bifflesook, everyone. What a brilliant sighting. Oh, can you smell them, Brian? Delicious. Beautiful smell. Zoe, on Twitter, you want to know, you say, oh, hang on, I'll get to you now, Zoe. Just want to get past these. Let's go and drive. I'm Shane. I'm just going to stay parallel with them for now. There they run. Just see where they go. We can't go in there, unfortunately. But Zoe, you say you didn't think that we eat about dogs out here, of course, because they're not considered an iconic African animal, normally, are they? You're absolutely right. You, they're not like coyotes, though. They are much more like wolves. They are the African equivalent of wolves. Very similar social structure, very similar hunting strategy. Yeah, they still, we can just see them going through the woodland there. I'm so glad we got to see them. Well, Brian, it's been lean times for me, but that's made up for it all, hasn't it? Just stop up here. There's a little bit of a clearing. Now, our beard, you want to know if wild dogs are actually related to... are actually related to domestic dogs or if they are, in fact, um, like a hyena. No, they are related to domestic dogs in so much as they're from the same family. So they come from the family Canidae. The domestic dog, I suppose, would be known as Canis domesticus, which means domestic dog. They are not from the same genus, though, whereas jackals and wolves are from the same genus. They're from the Canis genus, so they're much more closely related. A step away from that would be these wild dogs, which are in the genus Lycaon, which uh, is not the same. It doesn't have any other representative, so they're in a genus distinct from all the others, but that does mean that they can't interbreed with any other dog. But they are susceptible to other canid dog diseases, like rabies and canine distemper. That's one of the reasons they are so endangered. Oh, marvelous.
And Mike Costin, a very good question about how far they can hear noise. They've obviously got those enormous ears and of course they do have to listen quite carefully to each other because when they hunt, they go, they explode off in different directions and the way they keep in contact is with a loud whooping call and with a chattering noise. And they need those big ears to be able to follow each other and accurately predict where they'll find each other. And you say, how far can they hear? I would say they can probably hear up to um, two miles, two miles or so, maybe up to even more than that. And especially if they're making that loud whooping call, then I suspect they can probably hear up to about five miles, maybe. Maybe not quite five miles, but pretty far, further than us. All right, everyone, that's it for the wild dogs, I'm afraid. Let's turn around. We'll just have one more look at the dam back there, just in case they haven't turned back towards the dam. And I'll just keep listening on the radio to see if they don't come back this way. There's a very chilled out looking impala in front of us there, so I don't think they're coming back this way. There they are. I'm just listening on the radio. They're going further in there north towards a camp called Jukana Camp. So I think that's going to be it for our dogs this morning. Whew. It's always um, it's always something of a, a, a breathe out of relief when you've been chasing to get to see them. Mm. You're right, Rusty. Well done. Ryan, you okay? I'm all right. Yes, Thank you're okay. You. I did hit one puddle uh, that wasn't there before that sent uh, Brian sort of three feet into the air. Now, Kevin Blandy, you say those dogs look hungry and a bit beat up. Dogs always look hungry, these are wild dogs. They don't ever get that sort of fat look that lions get where you can see that they've just had a giant meal. Um, so they always look lean and like they're after a meal. They won't struggle to find something to eat today. They're excellent, excellent hunters. And yes, I agree with you that we saw that one that we had close by certainly looked beaten up. That's just a hard life of being a wild dog. It's not easy. They live a very physical life and they live a life of running through bushes and that's why his ears were torn. I'm pretty sure that's not from fighting. Just hang on a second. Sorry, go again with that. Orbs confirmed they're still going north. Uh, James, now they changed. Uh, they're going more east now. Okay, copy, thanks. Confirmed still inside the hustle. They have yeah, turned are. east. Uh, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to go to the dam here. We're going to have a quick look, turn around, and go back along the Bivazel cut line. Okay, I think one or two. They're pretty close to the cut line here, so I think we're going to carry on along here. There's more coming behind you. They're definitely still on Buffalo's hook. Okay, yeah, also just the uh, That's so cool, isn't it? Okay. We'll just keep driving along here and see if they don't pop across and we'll go to Buffalo's hook dam and see what's going on there. Is that all right with you, Brian? No, it's okay with you. Anyway, for those of you who don't know, I know there are a few new viewers. The reason I get so excited about wild dogs, they are Africa's second most endangered carnivore, and that makes it sound less impressive than it actually is. Uh, but they are highly endangered. There are only 450 left in this country, which is a tiny number. There are probably less than 2,000 left in the whole world. I'm just going to drive a bit quicker. Sorry, Leanne, you're going to have to go again with that. There's some water back on the road, an impala on the road, but I think they're coming towards here. Rich Levine, you're interested in what the large 
largest animal a pack of wild dogs could take down. Here they normally only take down things the size of impala. It's very seldom that they take down anything larger than that. But in East Africa, they will absolutely take down things like wildebeest. I'm not sure why they don't bother here. Uh, we have seen them go for a herd of wildebeest here once, but the dogs turn, the wildebeest turn around and chase the dogs off. I think it's be probably because impala are easier pickings. There's so many of them here. I'm just going to keep listening here. I'm on a you can uh, take it down there. It's all the sign. smell but it's not a nice smell because it's a delicious smell is it Brian? If you think of a, your wettest and grubbiest dog that is what it smells like and it is an unmistakably doggy smell. Even if you've never smelt it before if you've seen or smelt a domestic dog if you smelt a wild dog out here you know exactly what it was. Now they're somewhere just north of the boundary here inside next to this dam. from America, he's going to plead the Fifth Amendment, and he's not going to say anything about that. Um, none of them scare me. I have faith in all of the presenters. They are the best. <laughs> That's just a beastly lie. We're just going to drive slowly along here. All right. Sutton, you're on Twitter. You want to know if hyena can hear as wild as well as wild dogs? I don't know, Anna Marie. I really couldn't tell you that. Um, I, you know, I would imagine that they're able to hear in a very similar fashion. They probably have very similar hearing skills. Whether it's the same or not, I don't know. Uh, maybe the dogs a little bit more. They've got slightly larger ears, which will not be a completely pointless adaptation. Here goes Craig. Good luck. Good luck. Are you just waiting around? Yes, I'm waiting like a vulture. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, no problem. Bye. <laughs> yes, it's exactly right. Santa Price, a comment unrelated, of course, to the question you then asked. A very kind comment. Thank you, you say. I always put a smile on your face. Well, that's good. Um, there are not many people I have that effect on. And <laughs> you say, how often will wild dogs eat? And Natasha, they will eat twice a day quite often, especially if they've got young ones in the pack like that. And I think the Sands pack is only five... Is I'm not mistaken, six adults at the moment and five pups. I'm not sure exactly. That's the first time I've, I've actually seen the Sands pack. And they will 
eat twice a day, like I say. They'll hunt early morning and late afternoon is when they go hunting. They don't have to eat twice a day. They can get away with a day without food. Not much more than a day without food. They'll start to get very hungry. They obviously have a very high energy balance, much higher, for example, than in the cats. They don't sleep as much as the cats do. And when they are active, they're moving all the time. They really are very, very active. And because they eat largely a protein-based diet, it's expensive to make energy, and that means they must eat often. Look at the sun just breaking through the clouds there, leaving this lovely rays, like spotlights from the heavens. You see that, Brian? I do see Spotlights from the heavens. Beautiful. Mm. Thank you, Kevin Florida, making a, a topical, uh, topical comment there, according to the Oscars. You say, <laughs> the Oscar goes to James Brian Rusty. Thank you very much. I think the Oscars should go to the dogs, probably. Yeah. I'm assuming that the Oscars are going on as we speak. This is interesting. Scott says that they've been with hyenas and, and I'm not sure how I missed that. Okay, I don't know if that'll be visual for us, but we're going to hire along towards the dam where we were, where I suspected we should have waited, but alas, we did not. Now, Scott, unfortunately, is black screen. He doesn't have any picture at the moment, and that's why he can't come and kind of help out with this. There will also be probably quite a few vehicles in the sighting, so I'm not sure that we're going to get a look. Anyway, we'll try. sighting there are already three vehicles there they are north of the boundary so we probably wouldn't be able to see it that well anyway Ugh. I've told them we're gonna stand by sorry I'm just listening to the radio everyone trying to figure out what's going on Yeah, unfortunately, it's just the way it is. So just to ex just to explain, what we do is we don't go into... Oh, there's a dog behind us. Right there, Brian. Right there. <laughs> That's nice. 
<laughs> He's obviously using his big ears to try and find the rest of his pack. Well, that's a nice surprise. So just to explain, for those of you who are new viewers, we don't put more than three vehicles in a sighting, and the reason for that is that it just does... Um, it does affect the animals if we put too many in there, and we also want to keep it pri as private as possible for the guests of the area. So unfortunately, we will we'll lurk around the area and hope, perhaps, that we're able to get another view. You can hear the hornbills calling. Right, I think let's just ease down. I think what we um, oh, we can't really. We can ease down Aubrey's Road. We'll do that. Rather than just stand here, because I think they're going to be quite a long time in that sighting. you're in Minnesota and you want to know what the reason is for the lack of dogs or why they struggle so much, why there are so few. There are a few reasons. One of them is their susceptibility to domestic dog diseases. So they do get canine distemper, like I said, and rabies. And combined with that is the fact that they have these very wide and large home ranges, which means that they cannot, they are inevitably going to come into contact with human settlements, which means that they're going to come into conflict with A, with stock farmers, and B, with, uh, they're going to come into contact with communities where dogs are not inoculated, uh, you know, very poor communities where domestic animals are not inoculated, there are no veterinary uh, services, and so the dogs pick up those diseases. And that's basically why they're so endangered. I mean, their home ranges are 450, 450 to 1,000 square kilometers. That's 45,000 hectares, or say 100,000 acres for one territory, all the way up to all the way up to 100,000 hectares, um, which is uh, 240,000 acres for just one home range. So you can imagine they've just got an enormous, enormous area that they cover going to have to stand by here, I'm afraid. Let's have a look at that beautiful, beautiful European Arola. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Hello, Georgian in Illinois. You say you've bumped your head on Ferrari safari with both Scott and Brent uh, while chasing wild dogs before. Well, I'm sorry about that, Georgia, and I'm, I hope you didn't bump your head while driving with me. I would be deeply upset if I had caused an injury to your forehead. That is a European roller, and he likes to sit on that perch. He's there quite often. So the dogs are not far from here. They are in, still inside Buffalo's Hook, though, so... I think we're probably going to have to call it quits fairly soon. But what a lovely morning it's starting to become. You see the way the light is breaking through the clouds. Hmm. Marvelous. All right, everybody, I think we're going to probably just can this. I don't want to sit around here for the rest of the day. I think it will become extremely boring for everybody. We'll just have a quick look at the Cape Glossy Starling over here. But while we do that, let's head across to Scott. He is back up and running, and I'll see you just now. Well, it sounds like the usual chaos and excitement that wild dogs bring with them. Let's hope that James manages to sneak you guys in there as soon as possible. It sounds like an almighty fight is breaking out between hyena, wild dog, and 
It sounds like a young impala that was killed initially by the wild dogs and stolen by the hyena. So exciting stuff there, I guess. The fact that the hyena have stolen the wild dog's food means that the wild dog may need to look for more breakfast elsewhere, which could work out well in our favor. There's been no further sign of these lions. So uh, I'm going to go back into the last general area where their tracks have been and try and work out what's going on. Like I said, they could well be in the middle of a big block where their tracks last headed into, where they may be sleeping, where they may have successfully managed to make a kill. Who knows? Exciting news for the bird watchers. There are a pair of black crowned night herons that we try to show you guys, but with the signal issues and together with the fact that the birds were not playing along with us, it meant that we were unsuccessful. But I can show you a picture in the book of what we will be trying to show you guys. The next time we head past the Buffalo or Quartzal, I'm fairly certain it's going to be a new bird for a lot of you. It's a small heron, and as its name suggests, black crowned. It's got a black crown. Night heron. It's active at night. And it's small. I mean, it's probably a third of the size of a regular gray heron, the herons that we usually see here. So very small. It's got short legs, along with all of its kind of cousins, the green-backed heron, the white-backed night heron, the bitterns. If you compare them to the other herons, as I turn over the page, these are the other herons with much longer legs and longer necks. So you get two distinctly different models of heron. You get the limousines and you get the short wheelbase, just like our vehicles compared to the long game viewers, I guess. And they would have just moved in. They migratory birds. They move big distances. Some have been tagged in the Cape the southern tip of Africa and then being found subsequently in Mozambique, more than a thousand miles away from there. But they also spread far north of the equator. So a migratory bird, but they've come into the buffers of Quartzal since that rain, so that's made a more favorable environment for them. Robin, you would like to know if there have been any sunbird sightings so far this year. And yes, there have been. I'm not sure how many we've managed to actually get on camera, but they certainly are here. We see them a lot in and around the gardens where there may be one or two flowers. Um, so yes, we do see sunbirds. There's a whole host of different sunbirds that we see here. The chance of seeing one today, I guess, are slim, statistically speaking, because it's they're such small birds and they're very fast moving and there's not many flowers around at the moment. So not an easy bird to find, but there are many different types. I mean, in the Kruger National Park, <clears throat> let's see how many sunbirds we, we see in this area or this general area, not necessarily right here at Juma. Okay, so already on this page we've got five different species of which I've seen scarlet chested here at Juma. I've seen the white bellied. We will get the college here. I haven't seen any recently though, and we'll probably also get the Mariko. So all of those we should get here. And that's all of them. That's all five of the sunbirds that you get in the Kruger very pretty, but only when the sun catches them at the correct angle do they iridesce. Lily B. 
be here. Who just contacted, contacted us on Twitter has, told, has just said that they've got 65,000 screenshots so far. That is a staggering amount. And you say you've deleted just as many. And you're blaming it on, on us for telling you to take the screenshots. Um, apologies. I take responsibility along with the other presenters for that. Um, I'm surprised that buttons on whatever device you are screenshotting are still working. That's impressive. You should get a hold of the manufacturer of your device and tell them that you're very impressed with the buttons because that is remarkable. I hope you've got a good archiving system, otherwise it must be difficult to keep track of all of them. I don't know where to go now, actually. We've checked this road initially. There was no sign of the lions crossing it. It is a hard road, though, so they could well have crossed over Gowrie Cut Line to the east. Let's check a road that we haven't checked just yet. Other people have checked it. People have checked all the roads in this area. The Woodlands Kingfisher calling above us. Check. Them has got it there. to driver ants. You would like to know if we've seen them, and yes, we do get driver ants here. They're very large, and they are winged. They can fly. So we do see them here from time to time. I haven't seen one recently, though. Earlier on in early summer, there were a few about, but have not seen any since then. feeling that the Inkuhuma ladies may well be somewhere off to our right. It's a very, very big block with not many roads going through it. Hello, Tammy in Indiana. You would like to know a little bit about people that come on safari, which nationalities are there? Are there lots of South Africans that come on safari? And it all depends, Tammy, on where exactly you may be talking about, specific safari locations. The Sabi Sands is not really frequented much by South Africans because it's too expensive for South Africans. Whereas many people with stronger currencies than our poor rand, uh, can come for a very cheap holiday here relative to what they would be paying in their home countries. The countries then, furthermore, it depends which camps in the Sabi Sands you may be working at. Certain camps may appeal to American clients, other camps may appeal to European clients and specifically cater for them. Um, but a mix of people from all around the world, we don't get many... And it's interesting, you don't get many uh, Asian people doing high-end safaris. They tend to do cheaper safaris and big buses that go through the Kruger National Park. So they do on safari, but we don't see them here in the Sabi Sands. So I think there's an equal mix. One nationality that doesn't really come on safari, high-end or low-end, are Russians. That's one nationality that I haven't noticed many of. But the rest of the world tend to come in varying numbers. Uh, depending on the camps, I guess, where you may be working. South Africans, they love coming on safari. Some more than others. You'll find some South Africans have never seen a lion or an elephant in their life and have never been to some of our national parks. Whether that's because it's not something of interest to them or whether they are disadvantaged and, you know, don't have finances available to do that, I think there's a, a mixture of the two. Um, this is a... 
poverty-stricken country, a third world country, so there are, are a lot of people that simply don't have enough money to come out in safari, sadly. Um, and those South Africans that do, like I say, will, will not really come to the Saudi Sands. Very few will be able to afford coming here. Virginia and Kentucky, you'd like to know if we have responsibilities trying to maintain these vehicles um, or whether there's a mechanic. Thankfully, there is a mechanic because not one of the guides in our crew is mechanically minded. Maybe some are more than others, but no, we have Opa, a mechanic who helps our, get our vehicles checked and kept in, in good shape. We do the basic stuff, check the oil, water, all the engine fluids, you know, make sure the general running of the vehicle is sound, but we thankfully are not relied upon to do anything more than that. And I guess that's the case for a lot of South African lodges. Your, again, it depends, but at the more professional lodges, as a guide, that is what you're expected to do. You're expected to guide your guests. Um, not be a mechanic and a jack of all trades, be more of a professional for why the people are coming out here for you, for this experience. So most camps I've worked at have, like I say, have professionals looking after the vehicles and guides doing their job, guiding guests, not running around doing a million other things in between. Whereas in other parts of Africa, up in East Africa, when I spend time there, there you've got to do everything. There you're the camp manager, the guide, the mechanic, the chef. <laughs> Only kidding, but you are required to do more things. Okay, good news, James is in position. Over to the dogs. Eating together. Oh. People, there's an incredible sighting going on. This is the best possible view we can get, I'm afraid, though, but you can see all the dogs and the hyenas chasing each other. I think the dogs killed a baby zebra. If, if I heard the radio correctly, that's what's going on. Anyway, we can't go any closer than this, but isn't that astonishing? They kind of have come to an arrangement, it looks like, where they are prepared to tolerate each other, but I think that's simply because there are more hyenas there than there are dogs, and so the hyenas have now stolen the kill. And the best thing that we saw, come herring across the road, was little June, aged just over six months now, well, eight months, born in June, she came rushing out across the road to join the fray there and is now probably eating on her first scavenged meal, perhaps. Now, you see, every time those hyenas turn their backs, the dogs will go in on them. But we can't go any closer than this, I'm afraid. Anyway, very nice, I mean, incredible. It looks, at this distance, it just looks like they're the kind of similar looking animals to sharing some meat. But they've been having a right royal rumpus, as it, as it were. Yeah, go ahead. You didn't have any further sign of being for Amazing. Anyway, we're gonna keep, I think we're just gonna stand by here and see what happens. They might come back this way. Hmm. Yeah, they're moving again. Ah, Dino, what a brilliant question. You're from Washington State. I'm not sure we've heard from you before, so very nice if we haven't. Uh, thank you for watching us and thank you for sending a question, especially thank you for telling us where you are. Dino, you say that... Um, how, if you see dogs for the first time, do you know who the alpha is? Do you know, it's just from their behavior, basically. In a pack like this, um, it it's, will normally be the male, or the alpha, there is an alpha pair. The alpha male will lead the hunt. So if you ever see them on the hunt or on the move, the alpha male will be the one in front. The alpha female can lead a hunt, but normally it's the alpha male. And that's the best way to tell. He's normally the oldest and largest male, but they have, you know, they're so similarly sized that it's not often the best way of telling. It's only when they're moving can you truly tell. If you know a pack, though, or if you know wild dogs, just hold on a sec. Go ahead. Um, where are you? 
Sandy Patch. Sandy Patch. Okay, copy text. Um, can I come onto the fiber? Okay, we've been called in, everybody. This is very exciting. Apparently, there's a hyena dragging a kill this way. not in the dog sighting officially, so we can be here officially. There they are, they're the hyenas. Let's try and get through this area, I can smell blood. And Cat and Tampa, you're absolutely right. You say, look at the size comparison. Absolutely, there's a huge size difference, isn't there? So there you can see the young hyenas. You can see the adults are eating. The dogs have all off. You can probably saw the flash of the vehicles to the left. The dogs are all over there. And as cat, you can, you're absolutely right. You can see the difference in size. A wild dog is much more slightly built than a hyena is. There's a jackal. There's a black black jackal in there as well. You see that? Did you get it, Brian? Did you just, straight, straight in front of us. I'm just going to pull forward. First black black jackal I've seen here. Yeah, just, just as <laughs> Brian is unbelievable. Straight, straight through there, Brian. There, just moving next to the big hyena. Yeah. How cool is that? That is so cool. I'm just going to roll back. <laughs> it's just awesome. Two dog species, yeah. Now, for those of you who don't know what a jackal is, a jackal is basically the evolutionary equivalent here of a coyote. And there we have all the hyenas. I know it's not a great view, everyone. I shall try and go back. Let me try and just go back a bit. Oh, and the dogs are just watching on, looking at their kill. It seems to be in a pile of rubble, which is a little disconcerting. Now we can see them all. They killed Brian. I think it was. Now that jackal is taking its life in its hands coming through here. Now, Vincent from Ohio, interesting question. You say, were the painted dogs of Africa introduced like the dingoes of Australia, or were they? Are they naturally occurring? No, they're completely naturally occurring. They're not like the dingoes of Australia at all. <laughs> Hyenas now fighting with each other. There's the jackal. The jackal's coming in again. It's bizarre. I've never seen a black black jackal in the Sabi Sands. Well, I've seen one or two, but it's not usual. Fat belly, yeah, you on fat the thing. Northern side of the road. That is definitely from our den, is that? I think that's uh, probably madam. Really uh, not her best angle. Stolen from the doggies. They're just lying off.
to the side looking a bit miserable. I'm trying to find out what it's they've killed here. I don't think it's a zebra, do you, Brian? I don't know. I'll just ask Tex on quickly. Tex, what did they kill? Uh, it was a baby kudu. Copy, thanks. It was a young kudu. Now, I don't know if any of you were watching the other night when we watched the Nkahuma Pride killing a baby zebra. There they, there they go, the dogs. They're chasing the jackal. <laughs> that zebra being kind of eaten alive, which was very disconcerting to see. And people often ask questions about the savagery of wild dogs and why don't they kill the animals first. The death for any prey of wild dogs is often much faster than it is for the prey of lions. The dogs are still around. I think they were just chasing that jackal off simply because, you know, they could take it out on the jackal because they're bigger than the jackal. Champagne, no. I'm just uh, talking to the internet. All right. <laughs> Hello, Virginia and Kentucky. Um, I missed your question. Sorry, there was somebody next to me asking if I had any champagne on board, which I, which I, I don't. Could you, could you go again with that question? <laughs> Virginia's question. Oh, sorry, my, and then after I was disconcerted by that request from next door, I then unplugged myself. Virginia, sorry, once more can we have your question? Yes, Virginia, you say so glad that my dry spell is over. I'm absolutely relieved that my dry spell is over. Incredible sight. There, the, there go some hyenas. They're going back towards the den. Brian, there's huge action going on here. Now the dogs are running around. They're gathering their, gathering their numbers. There's one or two hyenas. They immediately picked up that the numbers were back in their favor. But of course, this is all over now as a kill. And I think what we'll find is that these hyenas will disappear back to the den and the dogs will go off and, and the dogs will go off and try and catch something else. There they go, one of the hyenas is charging through there. And spotted Ozzy from Perth, you want to know if this is the same group of hyenas that we're watching all the time? Yes, absolutely it is. There's a hyena coming. Right through here. The scarback female. Here we go. The dogs are chasing the young hyenas. This is unbelievable. This is incredible. I'm just going to be quiet. Just watch this.
into Buffalo's Hook, a little distance away from us. Wow. I'm astounded that that one hyena managed to fight off 10 dogs. myself back in in my excitement I unplugged myself okay Leanne I'm back in one hyena ten wild dogs so close you couldn't even see them and incredible that those dogs did not want to have anything to do with the business end of that hyena they tore at her backside and if she hadn't backed up against that tree behind us, I'm pretty sure. If she hadn't backed up against that tree. Apparently Scott is with the hyena. Let's go across to him. Welcome back, everyone. And isn't this awesome chaos and confusion? There's two hyenas just ahead of us. Hello and goodbye. Good morning. <laughs> Two hyena just going off to our left here. James is in front of us, so we're currently kind of, I don't know, directly in front of him. We're going to send you straight back to him now. It looks like he's got some better views than us. Well, <laughs> we're still with the dog, so I just wanted to say that hyena backed itself very cleverly into this tree. And what it did was then make sure that the backside, which had been torn already by those dogs to pieces, was then protected. And none of those dogs, not one of them, was prepared to get near the business end of that hyena because with those jaws, with those incredibly powerful jaws, the most powerful jaws in Africa, that hyena would have done some very serious damage to any dog that got into the way. One bite on the limb of one of these dogs would cut a limb off, and the dogs know that. And despite the fact that they were overwhelmingly odds in their favor, despite that, they backed off, and the hyena, well, we'll see. It remains to be seen whether the injuries will harm it for the long term, but I suspect not. You can see how scarred those hyenas always are, and that's because they get into scraps like this and they survive. Uh, 
Wat la hele? Andrew, wat la hele? Ga na aan. Okay, listen, we can go back to the hyena with Scott quickly. And there's an elephant there, of course, as well. Well, isn't this exciting, everyone? Absolute pandemonium is breaking out here. And I'm hoping that James manages to get some views from our northern boundary. Sadly, we can't go any further. Look at this hyena. Is it looking for tiny little scraps? I think it could be. Obviously, I haven't been here, so I don't know exactly where the carcass was torn apart. But it looks like this hyena is looking for some scraps. Wonderful. What are you looking for? seemed to try and nibble on something earlier, but maybe it is just sniffing the scent trail of either the wild dogs and or the other hyena. What is that dripping? Why is it urinating like a broken tap? I've never seen a hyena in this state before. Maybe it's a must. <laughs> VM has suggested that it is in a sexually heightened stage called must, which is only typical of elephants. What are you doing? So it's purposefully kind of urinating, possibly marking scent. Maybe it's two different clans of hyena that have converged on this area. Mr. you would like to know where is the hyena den from here? It's not far away at all. It's about half a mile away to the south of us. This certainly is interesting. It looks like this also could be a male to me, maybe not. Just trying to see if I don't recognize it from our den. Hmm. Which I don't, she's covered in scars. I'm not sure if any of you guys recognize her. Anyway, her or him, I can't tell whether it is a male or a female, but really interesting behavior to see how it was just dribbling a little trail of urine as it was walking there. Certainly leaving behind some kind of a message to the other hyena. Good, we're gonna send you back to James. just waving at Scott there. And we've got an elephant bull, a magnificent elephant bull here. And he's sitting at the dam, perhaps thinking about having a drink. And he's standing with his ears out like that because he can hear what's going on in the bush to the east of the dam. That's to the right of your picture. And there, the pack of dogs has seemingly killed something else. But they've gone quiet now. I think it must have been something very small, possibly a scrub hare. That is a wild guess. <laughs> but they went quiet quite quickly, so whatever it was was devoured. Isn't that bull great? Uh, Andrew, can I come back and join you? He is absolutely magnificent. That's yeah, a fam, big uh, old bull, that one. Back, uh, south. So They're coming back south, the dogs. Be, uh, so we'll just keep watching. All right, copy. And Scott is probably in the correct position to get them if they do pop out of the fuss. Uh, there goes the bull. And he will be going to investigate. He won't like having predators around. For some reason, the elephants are very... Well, they don't like any predators around, but, I mean, even the... F no dog would ever pose a threat to an elephant. And Brent had the most unbelievable sighting a little while back where the dogs were chasing 
And as the elephants were chasing the dogs away from the little puddle of water at Treehouse Dam, uh, repeatedly. So they just don't like the predators. I'm just going to move because he's standing behind the one bush. Oh, there's a grey hornbill. Well done, Brian. Southern grey hornbill. It's dipping flight. Let's move so that we can see this elephant having his drink. Just be over there. The I can actually, you won't be able to see them. I just saw a dog running through the clearing through the back there. And I mean, if it hadn't been in the middle of a drought, I definitely wouldn't have seen him. Uh, might be worth just standing by right here to see what happens. You can see the elephant is not quite comfortable yet. Suddenly, is peace. <laughs> this is amazing. There's a dog, Brian. I don't, there, it's coming up towards the dam wall. Oh, coming to the dam. Here comes a dog. Aru, you want to know why it is that the other hyenas didn't come and help that one? I think that's a very good question. I, I, I don't know. I can only think that they'd, you know, they'd gone away, but they would have heard that definite fight that they were having, and normally hyenas will rush in to help each other when they hear a noise like that. Maybe they were engaged in a fight of their own over some food. I definitely saw one or two of them, the youngsters, running north into Bill's Hook, so maybe they were chasing something else. I don't know. But that was, to me, the most incredible... Uh, demonstration I mean, we had that zebra kill the other day raw wilderness and that fight that savagery that true fight for survival was absolutely unbelievable to watch just yeah you know and then suddenly all is peace this incredible kind of peace is now just infusing me. And as Wicked Blues Band asks the question, how's my heart rate now? It's now starting to go down again. And instead of that raw savagery, which is all around us, it's dissipated completely. And now the energy is one of complete peace as we watch that elephant bull having his drink. And the hippo gently in the background next to the next to the alley you can just see it sticking its head out the water there and it could escalate again i can hear the dog screaming now inside the bush suddenly the piece is shattered the elephant's head lifts And you can hear the radio going. I'm just leaving it on there so that you can hear what's happening. Craig's just calling in that they're heading some north, some east. So as far as you're concerned, north is towards the dam wall there, and east is to the right-hand side of your picture. And the ultimately peaceful bird, the chin spot batters, calls after that utter savagery we just had. Hmm. Right, Scotty is still with the hyenas, so let's head across and get an update from him. Well, we've got two sub-adult hyena slinking about you. We're probably 100 meters or so behind James. It sounds like a wild dog don't know which direction they want to go and they're moving north, south, east, west, backwards, forwards. And it'll be interesting to see what happens if the wild dog get a hold of these two hyena because they are much smaller and a lot less experienced than the other hyena I've seen running around here. But the two, just like that other one, are sniffing about very intently 
and I think they've come into this area to investigate. I'm not sure if you guys have seen them running around here as the chaos was unfolding earlier. Ooh, they've stopped and they're listening. They were at least for a second listening back in the direction of where those wild dogs are moving. They've now decided to start running off. Away from the action, maybe they've realized what they're up against. Hello, Vicky in Chicago. You'd like to know if there's any chance that the wild dogs would follow the hyena back to the den. There is a chance that would happen. Um, you say that the hyena have got the advantage. Um, that's not always necessarily the case. Maybe they have had the advantage temporarily this morning, but wild dogs can certainly cause a lot of mayhem for hyena. They can really pin them down and, and cause a lot of damage to them, like we saw uh, not so long ago, uh, towards the end of last year, we saw a pack of wild dog really teaching a hyena a lesson. So they can, um, obviously, at a den site, the, the young pups can run down into the burrows where they can escape. And if, if the adults needed to, they would obviously try and defend the, the cubs. Interestingly, Jamie was at the hyena den and she was answering a question as to what would happen if wild dogs came up onto the scene. And you wouldn't believe it, but 30 seconds later, wild dogs arrived. And all that happened was that the wild dogs ran through and it was the same pack, actually. It was the Sands pack that ran through didn't really get too involved, didn't really bat an eyelid at the hyena. The adult hyena just lay there f where they were, watching the wild dogs run around. The wild dogs definitely would have known that it was a hyena dead, but didn't pay too much attention to it. Well, it looks like we've got the old, older hyena, the scarred hyena that we've seen dribbling from its genitals, either a penis or a greatly enlarged clitoris, depending on whether it's a male or a female. It's going to come straight past us. We're going to get some great views. Well, Eric, very happy to hear that you're still sh uh, shaking with excitement after that incredibly exciting uh, experience you shared with James and the wild dog and the hyena. They really do cause such a fuss when they're on the property of the wild dogs, wonderful animals to have around. So happy that you got to experience the joy and excitement of following them. It's gonna reverse. It looks like there's been quite a commotion under this tree. I can see a lot of luth loose soil. Oh, you can even see a little bit of blood on this hyena's rump where it would have received a nip from the wild dogs. Just to the right of its spine, I could see a tiny little chunk of flesh missing. But I wonder what exactly happened under this tree because, like I said, there's clear sign of a lot of movements where animals have been running around under this. So possibly that's where a hyena may have tried to seek refuge when it was under attack by the wild dogs. I'm not sure, but there's clear sign, and you could clearly see that hyena sniffing intently over there. I didn't make my way past the hyena den on the way here, but it appears like all the hyena are actually, well, at least were actually here. They may slowly be making their way back there, so maybe we'll pop in on our way back to camp just to see if all is in order. But I think for now it does make sense for us to stay in case those wild dog keep coming south. Wouldn't it be just absolutely wonderful to know what it's thinking? Why is it still lurking around you? What is it trying to achieve? What's going on in that little head of yours, Aina? Probably doing some damage control. It's probably starting to feel the nips from the wild dog. Now, if this was the individual that was attacked because of the kind of adrenaline and excitement is subsiding. And now it's going to start to appreciate the tenacity of those wild dogs. It's fascinating that they do take on prey or other predators so much bigger than them. 
are, you know, at least twice the size of your average wild dog. I even saw a clip quite recently, it's just a photographic sequence, rather, of wild dogs attacking a lioness. And that was a phenomenal sighting that was at, I think it was up in Botswana, where that lioness made the wrong move and took on a pack of wild dogs alone. I think there's even a fleck of blood on the Sainer's face, on the, just above its, yeah, you know, look, just below its eye and its mouth. So it's got another little nip there. And going back into the area, still not content with its investigations. Beautiful dark clouds in the sky today. Really been loving the, the scenery out here. Hopefully some of these dark clouds will actually bring us some rain. Didn't see. Didn't see. Okay, I missed all the action. Looking but it sounds like you guys got some good stuff. Yeah. Very nice. They did? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So Craig says the wild dogs headed east away from the water. So there's still a chance they're going to continue south from there. So I might turn around and follow Craig and leave James to keep this area covered. James is just up ahead of us. Come on, wild dogs. Give us a surprise and come back. Curious one, you would like to know if wild dogs will, or sorry, the hyena will now find a little mud wallow to cool off in, or will it head back to the den? Uh, either of those two things are, are both likely options. Which one it's going to choose, it's hard to say. I'm not even sure if that hyena is in fact a member of our clan that does frequent the den. I don't recognize it, it's got lots of scars on it, so, but again, I'm the worst person to recognize these animals, you guys are often in a far better situation, both in terms of your understanding of how each animal looks different to the next, and also the fact that you'll be seeing it on big screens often clearer than our dusty little monitor that I'm looking at it through. But if it is a member of the, the, the clan and that den, it could head back there, or you know, if it doesn't have any responsibilities or cubs to feed, it could just go and relax in a mud wallow, soothing its injuries. Oh, I'm just gonna let Andrew come past. And he'll take it slowly, they can loop out of us. Morning, Andrew, morning, everyone. Looked like one of his guests was sleeping on the back there, hard to believe. <laughs> but I think she may have just been basking in the morning sunshine. It's a very nice feeling after what's been quite a chilly morning. Good to have the sun out. mistaken. Hyenas are known to trail predators like leopard and wild dog and lion. And you're wondering if that's the same here? Yes, definitely. Hyenas are very clever animals that know if they follow predators, there's a strong chance that they'll be able to steal an easy meal from them. And that's definitely the case with the hyena of the Sabi Sands. Now, whether or not the hyena were following the wild dogs or they heard them or saw the commotion, I'm not too sure. What was fascinating is how quickly the word spread. I mean, I'm not sure how many hyenas were 
around in total, but I'm guessing quite a few. So the word obviously spread. The Bush Telegraph was effective in getting that message across to the other clan members, or even members from other clans, but they all descended upon that opportunity quite quickly. For those of you who are a little bit more experienced and following uh, uh, with following us here on Safari Live in Juma, you'll you'll realize that most of the time the wild dogs, sorry, the hyena will actually move alone. Uh, yeah, enjoy. I'm going to travel along the uh, the pipeline, uh, checking closely with Carmen. Uh, I'll do it, but uh, they're coming to the market uh, uh, on So I just want to chat to Craig. He has relocated the pack. I just want to see if there's a chance they're going to come to us. Uh, Craig, uh, any chance they're going to continue to the cut line from there? Uh, they are stepping at the moment, they are all in the water, um, as soon as they do the pitching Okay, copy, thanks. Confirm, I should just stick around uh, the sign boards. Okay, okay, so good news, Craig has found the wild dogs again. We're just going to let these other guys pass. They... not on the wild dog, dog hunt, they're just trying to get to work, I think, wherever they may work, at one of the camps in Buffalo, I'm guessing. So the wild dogs at the moment are just off to our left. It sounds though like they may have just been cooling off in a little mud wallow. The whole pack is apparently in the water. That would have been fun to see. Um, From there, though, they need to continue south for us to see them. I fear, though, that Craig has just said that they're heading further east, not towards us. There's still a little a vague chance, though, that that could change. What you got there, Vin? Three o'clock. Looks like Vim spotted some warthogs. Stay forward a little bit, maybe. I know where we're. Are you going to come back and see the dad? Ah, little piglets. Where's your mum? To the left. Okay, VM says the mother is to the left. In the thicker bush. Sandra Evans, um, yes, I did hear that there was a jackal in the sighting. I'm not sure whether it was a black back jackal or a side striped jackal. But either way, very happy that you did get to see a jackal. Oh, it was the black-backed jackal. Actually less common in the Sabi Sands than the side striped. Yet a general rule in Southern Africa is that the side striped are less common. But it's a kind of rolls reverse in this Sabi Sands reserve. So count yourselves lucky to have seen that. Hyena and jackal all sharing kills in the Sabi Sands. Is it something that happens often? You've noted that in Botswana there's been a wild dog that's teamed up with a jackal. I haven't heard that. I've heard of wild dog spending time a lot with hyena, but I can't remember. Have I also heard and seen pictures of the jackal? Maybe I have. But that was a very rare scenario where one wild dog was basically marooned on an island, it was the last remaining member of its pack. And it adapted and did make friends with hyena and possibly jackal as well. So fascinating stuff. Because they are such highly social animals, I guess this very bizarre scenario um, that left this wild dog alone and no choice than to other, other than to make friends with hyena or jackal, you know, it did that. But it's not normal. Um, I guess it's a 
sad scenario that that specific wild dog was in. Regarding sharing kills, I mean, it does happen from time to time. We've seen leopard and hyena basically co-feeding, taking turns feeding on a carcass here. Um, it will happen from time to time, but I wouldn't say that it's common that you see those three species together sharing a kill. Very, very fortunate that you did get to see that. It's a, it's a rarity. And there's no, no way of describing why one day the wild dogs will be able to overpower a hyena and attack them and keep them at bay, and the other days they'll have to just succumb to them and share their food. It's not that they enjoy sharing with other species, that is for certain. Just weighed up the odds and thought that it's not worth the injury or risk so why don't they just both snack and be friends temporarily before going their separate ways. South Bend, Indiana, you would like to know if the jackal is more threatened by a wild dog or hyena. I would say wild dog because wild dog are faster and more capable of catching a jackal if they really wanted to. Hyena, I don't think, are nimble enough to be able to catch them. But obviously if a hyena did get a hold of a jackal, it would require just one bite with those bone crunching jaws. But like I said, the hyena are going to have a hard time trying to catch up to a, a very fast-footed, nimble wild, uh, jackal. We're going to make our way to the hyena den now to see what's going on there. I'm guessing we're going to find one or two members relaxing after the chaos, possibly nursing their cubs. I know one hyena apparently dragged a large portion of the kill away. And I've never actually seen a hyena return to a den with a large chunk of meat. So, I'm not sure where it would have taken it, maybe somewhere nearby to a little pantry. Tom and Susan, I'm told you guys were also wanting to go to the hyena den as well as Jennifer, I think so. Good news, we will be there shortly. minutes and we'll call you back when we do get there but for now you guys are going to go back to James for an update on what his plans are. We're still recovering of course from that astonishing sighting that we had there the hyena and the dogs and um, it will be known as the day of the hyena and the dogs from this day forth the leap year of 2016 the leap day we're going to go along to Biffles Hook Dam at the moment and see what we can find there. I know that the dog pack did head east down through Biffles Hook and they might pop out a little bit later, they might not. But it was just wonderful, wonderful stuff. And while you were gone, I had to do, we were putting together sort of a highlights package, it's exciting like that. We will then do a quick interview for and we'll edit it into a package at some stage. Now, I'm not sure when or how they'll be published, but that's the idea. And it's amazing to me how difficult it is to do a recorded talk versus a live one because obviously whatever I say now I can't edit it just goes out there but with a recorded one it's obviously slightly different so that's why it took me so long to come back to you I'm afraid some kudus here who lost one of their number today to those dogs
Tenny Pine, thank you for your very kind compliment as we reabsorb the peace of the wilderness. You say that you feel we are very professional because after a sighting like that, you would have had to go home. Um, yeah, it was emotionally draining and well, exhilarating at the same time. Um, and I was just chatting to Brian as, as you went off to Scott to watch the hyenas there. The, we get a lot of questions about danger out here and I'm often not sure and I'm still not sure how to succinctly put it. I think that people are fascinated by, I don't think it's so much the danger as it is the savagery of the wilderness. And I come back to this quote again and again, where an old Native American Indian said, he said, the wilderness will just as soon kill you as it will save you. And it's this juxtaposition for me of that wild savagery that we watched there with that hyena, its ears flat back on its head, its teeth bared, snapping at those dogs and the dogs coming from all angles, biting at its backside, trying to have a go at it. And then you go away from that and suddenly there's a chin spot batters calling like a piccolo after a, a huge Wagner kind of movement. It's just this and an elephant bull tossing a bit of water on his face or over his head. And suddenly from this uh, scene of savagery that we're not used to as human beings anymore, it's just this peace comes welling out of all over. And then it can escalate again back into it as the dogs chase off something else. And I think when people ask about the danger out here, I think what they're really saying is, can I touch that savagery? Can I touch that piece of life that is, well, it was part of all of us, of course. And I think that's what they're saying. I might be talking utter nonsense. Brian, what do you think? Brian's not, uh, Brian's not one to, uh, to, um, to pass compliments unless they're deserved. And so, yeah, he's, he's not looking too shocked. So I'm thinking maybe I'm, I might be getting somewhere close to what I'm actually trying to say. And uh, over the next little while, I'll try and succinctly put it. But I think when people say, is it dangerous out there? They want to know, is it, can I touch, can I touch that wild side of life? Well, you just did. So we'll go off to Bivelsville Dam and have a little bit of a relax. Now, Natasha, you want to know that hyena is going to recover from that injury. Natasha, I think that the hyena will absolutely recover. Uh, it did look like it was limping quite badly, but you know, hyenas are amazingly resilient. All of the animals out here are amazingly resilient. They can lose limbs sometimes and survive absolutely fine. A hyena, of course, can take a risk, unlike a leopard or a cheetah, because it lives in a clan. And so it has the safety of the clan. It can go back to the den where it can recover and it can lie there relatively safe in the knowledge that if something comes along, it will be alerted to whatever that thing's presence might be. And so it can recover there. And we had one of the males doing that the other day. And he looked for all the world. I mean, if you saw a domestic animal like that, you would assume that it was going to die. You'd rush it off to the vet. He was limping. It looked like his wrist was perhaps broken. It wasn't, though. And in two days' time, we saw him trotting off. Yeah, he looked a bit manky. Had a couple more battle scars, but he was fine. And I think that's going to be the case with that hyena. And that hyena is the scarback female. I think that's June's mother. A very distinct scar just underneath where her kidneys are experienced hyena, she knows what's going on. She knew what she was getting into there. Uh, Margaret Betcher, you want to know what started the fight? Margaret, it was simply the fact that there was food. 
and then what happened was initially i mean i wasn't there for the whole sighting but the what happened initially was that the dogs killed the kudu there were two or three hyena around they came in and then there was a standoff but the hyenas then started making a noise and all the other hyenas from the clan in the area heard about it and they went running in and then they outnumbered the dogs and so the dogs held back and they waited and they were in and out and that jackal that jackal was unbelievable coming in and out trying to steal a little piece of meat here and there and then it backed off again and what happened then was that the hyenas as brian said it's almost like the order to scatter okay and the youngsters went Phew! off into the north some of the adults went back towards the den and the scarback female <laughs> What did you describe her as, Brian? A greedy guts. Greedy guts. Greedy guts. <laughs> Picked up the head of the kudu and thought she'd just wander back to the den with it. And she suddenly found her isolated. And because the numbers then were suddenly in the dog's favor, they would have died if she hadn't backed up against the bush there. Eventually, she was, she was getting totally exhausted. You could see at the end that she was just dragging her backside around. Just going through the dip there where the signal isn't very good. And I think, like I said, I think they would have killed her had she not backed into that bush. She was getting very tired, you could see, and she was starting to lose kind of the speed of moving. What was that? Sorry, Leanne, all I heard was blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's linked to a bird with Scott. Well, I don't think I've ever managed to get you guys this close to a purple roller. Oh, it looks like it's about to fly. Look at that beautiful coloration on its wings. It's just come out of the Gallagher waterhole. That's why it's wet, and off it goes. It looks like it's going back there for another swim, maybe. No. We came to the Gallagher waterhole in the hope that we'd find a hyena wallowing here as there was no action at the den. So I figured that the hyena might be trying to cool off here. But it doesn't look like that is the case. It just appears like the purple roller was well, the only animal interested in cooling off now. There's the little water hole to our left there. Nothing in there. So who knows what the hyena up to. Maybe they're just chewing on whatever remains they managed to steal and run away with, or just catching their breath in a cool, shady area, or one of the many other mud wallows that are around at the moment after that recent rain we've had. But there were no sign of them at the den, sadly. So apologies for those of you who are eagerly awaiting that. I was really expecting us to find some there. But that is the joy of being on safari, as we so often say, you simply do not know what is going to happen and or when it may happen. A little bush buck. This is an antelope you don't see too often. This is a young male. It is the smallest of the spiral horned antelope that we get here. The bigger cousins are the Inyala. And there's, what is it? That's the young male again, but he does have his mother here as well. Hey, John in Tennessee. Well, you've joined us since the most recent Big Cat Week in November last year, and you've never seen a bushbuck yet. You've seen and done a lot of bird watching, you say. But I'm wondering if there are no bushbuck here. No, there are bushbuck. We just don't see them very often. They tend to like to hang around the camps and the riverine areas, which we don't have too many of here at Juma. So at least now you've got to see one, a young male, and his mother. Ah. Oh. I recognize his mother. She's got a very distinctive notch out of her left ear there. She's sometimes in our garden across at Inga's house, which is one of the areas of accommodation where some of us stay. The rest it's the of the one that chased you out of the shower. I don't know if it is the one that chased me out of the shower, VM. No, well, that was a big male. 
that was sleeping in my outdoor shower. It gave me the frights of my life. Thank you for reminding me of that. Not you, you're still a baby male. Maybe your father. Um, and I walked into the shower after dark and got the fright of my life. As this bush buck that was lying down right at the back end of the shower jumped up. Well, I'm not sure why my audio isn't working. Ah, you know why? I'm not picking it up. The battery's run out, you I know it hasn't, it's still there. No, I'm not your level. Uh, well, apologies for the crackly audio. Nothing's changed here, so not too sure what it could be. It's a generation, I suppose. Lioness have gone there. Well, hopefully, somewhere on our property. But that will be a surprise for the sunset safari. Well, James Richards, you've been doing some research on the black crown night terns that we'll hopefully be able to show you this afternoon or tomorrow morning at least. I'll specifically go out in search of them at the Buffalo Quartz Hole where I'm hoping they're going to camp out now that there is some water in there. And you say that the research that you have done is or has provided you or now us with the information that the black crown night terns that we get here are exactly the same as the ones that you get in America. Isn't that fascinating? You wonder how and when they managed to get across there. There are no birds that I know of that migrate across the Atlantic. Um, so maybe it was many, many thousands of years ago when all of the continents split that the black crown night heron headed across there and hasn't evolved since. Fascinating. running around the streets of India um, <clears throat> and you're wondering whether wild animals can be seen roaming the streets of the well-populated cities of South Africa. Firstly those, I know that you do get wild leopard also seen in cities in India. Whether it's wild elephants or domesticated elephants, which there are a lot of in India, I'm not too sure the ones that you say were roaming around those streets. But what's interesting is that uh, we know we, we, we don't really get wild animals roaming the streets of South Africa, especially not the big cities like Johannesburg, like you mentioned. Um, most animals, uh, wild animals, occur in a fenced, enclosed reserve where they can be protected from humans. Where they cannot be protected by humans, they tend to not do too well. Um, Having said that though, occasionally from time to time there are rare glimpses of wild animals in certain of some of the cities. Some uh, of the cities that border the Kruger National Park, or towns I guess are better words than cities. Um, recently a leopard was caught on CCTV outside a shopping chain called Woolworths in a town called White River very close to us. Um, kind of grocery store fascinating um, but it is known that leopards do slink in and around kind of urbanized areas flying below the radar very secretively um, some african countries like botswana still have elephants moving through or across major highways or on the outskirts of towns but in south africa it's very very seldom and if ever it is it's an animal that's escaped <clears throat> Although there's one town called St. Lucia in Zululand, north of Durban, the town where I live, where there's a lot of hippos that move through that little town. That's because they, they basically, the town is situated in the middle of a very large wetland area. 
where many hippos occur. So yes, occasionally you will see wild animals uh, in towns, but it's an absolute rarity in South Africa. Hello Boyd in North Carolina, you would like to know what is the fastest animal after the cheetah, or at least predator in this area? Well, it's probably over a short distance I would say leopard have the explosive speed that will put them second behind cheetah. But wild dog have got a different kind of speed and that's a speed that they can sustain for very long periods of time but probably not quite as explosive as a leopard but probably close the cheetah and the, uh, the leopard and the wild dog i think lions due to their bulk would be slightly slower I'm also forgetting the birds of prey. There's a lot of birds of prey that can move at incredibly high speeds as they hunt down their prey, but obviously that's comparing mammals to birds. The peregrine falcon is actually the fastest animal on the planet, faster than the cheetah, and it can reach speeds of actually 300 kilometers an hour, which is around how many miles? About 180 miles an hour, flying, literally, at breakneck speed. Let's hope we find you some predators while we continue towards the end of the sunrise safari and while we venture forth, we are going to be sending you back to James. We're here at Biffles Hook Waterhole, everyone, where there were some swallows swooping down onto the surface of the water, probably having a drink, maybe mm, gathering the odd insect. They're not renowned for doing that off the surface of the water, but here comes one now. Let's see if it drops down. Mm, no, it's just flying around. Now, I think what they're doing, they're flying around the top of the dam here because there are insects flying around too. And so the water which has attracted the insects will in turn be attracting the birds. But otherwise, there's not much going on here. So I think we'll probably press along and see what else we can see. It's, uh, it's difficult to maintain one's sense of uh, absolute enthusiasm after that unbelievable dog and wild uh, hyena sighting. Uh, but it is it's the most lovely morning. We have some sunshine. We have some clouds dissipating the sunlight. Michelle, you're in New Jersey, worried about little June, and you want to know if June and the other sub-adult got out of there. I'm pretty sure they did June, at least Michelle, who is not June. Um, you may lose the signal here. I'm just going to be quiet for a second while we go through, and I will answer your question the other end, but I'm pretty sure they got away, yeah. confident that June and the other satellite got away is that all of the dogs were seen at the dam just shortly after that and I think they killed again they killed that little scrub hare probably and yeah so I'm pretty sure that the, those they, they got away they were the first to run I'm not sure what as Brian said it was almost like the command to scatter was given and then they all disappeared and I'm not really sure why that happened but they were the first to run. They didn't run towards the den, interestingly. They ran deep into Biffle's Hook. But they will make their way back towards the den, I'm sure, as the day goes on. They were fine. We'll definitely go back there during the course of the evening and see if we can find the injured one. Now, Ack 
Aqua and St Stebbig from England. You say you reckon that that hyena was from a different clan and therefore that's the reason she wasn't helped by the others. Um, Aqua and Stebbig, I would say that that was a relatively valid comment, but for the fact that A, she was a female, which means it's unlikely that she would have gone anywhere near a, a sort of clan fight outside of her clan area without other clan members. B, I, we recognize her. We know her. She's got that scarred back. She's June's mother, as far as I'm aware. And C, when she did run away, eventually she went straight towards the den. So I'm pretty sure that she's from that clan. I I don't know why they left her alone. I think that they she suddenly found herself isolated, like, like, um, like Brian said. She was the last to leave the kill. She was the last one there trying to get food. And I think she just found herself isolated. And it will be very interesting to see this evening what she looks like and how she is, how she's feeling. And we'll see what else we can find on the way, but I can guarantee you it won't be anything like that. The other interesting thing is that we managed to get that ball of GoPros running at the same time, which means that that will eventually be a virtual reality sighting with any luck, and you will be able to look down at the dogs and the hyenas running where we couldn't even see them because they were too close. You'll be able to look down at them running under and around the thing. You'll be able to look at our expressions. You'll be able to even look at the other vehicles, and you'll perhaps see a dog or the jackals in the background. It'll be an unbelievable thing to see in a 360-degree environment. toll that this job takes and watching a sighting like that and does it take and take its toll emotionally um penny i'm to be honest no i don't think it does i think it's far more i don't think it's a drain i think it's a a fool watching a sighting like that because we are detached from it yes it is difficult watching something like that zebra and the lions that we watched the other night. Not so much the hyena and the wild dogs, because the hyena, you know, can defend itself, and it did defend itself admirably. But if you're watching lions on a zebra kill, and a zebra foal, then it, it's, um, then I felt a genuine sense of sadness. I didn't feel a sense of sadness today. I felt a sense of wonder, and a, fence, a sense of, I suppose it's a slight sense of horror, because um, you know that this hyena could die, it could be killed in front of you, then it would have been perhaps a little bit sad. But at the end of it, Penny, I don't feel emotionally drained. I feel, I feel fulfilled, I suppose, and it's because, as I was saying, it's, we're touching something that is real and natural and... Um, yeah, there's something very deep inside me that it's not like watching... It's not like watching two people fight, for example. I, I find that very difficult. I can't do that. And I don't think it's like um, a paramedic, for example, who's got to drive around and attend accident scenes and that sort of stuff. I think that is emotionally draining. And for me, because our species is slow, it's not our own species, it feels, yes, that, that the emotion, the sense of emotion is amazingly strong. And it's, there are times of sadness but it's times of exhilaration and it's times that it's touching something so deep inside and um, yeah that I don't feel that it leaves me drained. Brian do you feel drained by it at all? No. What did it leave you feeling? It's a tough one. It, it is, is difficult. One. I mean, Brian, of course, is also looking through the lens, and so he is removed. And so that's quite a difficult one. Okay. Well, <laughs> while we ponder on these uh, philosophical things, let's head across to a lizard with Scott. Well, this is an animal we don't get to see very often. It's called a blue-headed lizard. Oh, sorry, Zan. 
Didn't realize we weren't in gear there, so the car just started rolling back. This is, in all likelihood, a female uh, because of its more dull coloration. The males at this time of the year, during the summer months, will have usually a bright blue head. Very interesting agamas these. It's a tree agama or a blue headed lizard. I think a tree agama is the more official term for them. And look at how good its camouflage is along with that marula bark. It's a marula tree that it's latched onto. They sometimes do funny head bobbing motions when communicating with one another, shaking their heads backwards and forwards. So that's something to look out for on the next sighting we have of one of those little reptiles. Well, what a morning it's been. A lot of the action was not where we were, but happy that you guys got spoiled with some incredible scenes with the wild dog hyena and jackal. Three carnivores that I don't remember when last we've ever seen all three of those in the same sighting. So that could have been a first in over a year of taking safaris here. So. Thank you, VM, on camera. Thank you, Leanne, who directed the show, and to everyone else who was lending her hand in the final control room. And thank you, of course, to you guys for your help and contributions. It's been great fun, and I'm looking forward to the sunset safari. Hopefully, we're going to track down the Inkohuma pride, as well as those black crown night herons. So something to look forward to for the predator lovers and for the bird watchers. Anyway, for now, back to James. We'll see you all on the sunset safari. We're back with us for the last few minutes, everyone, and I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm slightly overwhelmed by the thing, so I'm perhaps not expressing myself quite clearly enough. Um, yeah, what an amazing sighting. I tell you what, in the last three and a half minutes, please quickly tweet through in three words how that made you feel. Just in three words, quickly hashtag Safari Live, tell us what you felt, or send us an email. Just a quick one from the last three and a half minutes, and show, tell us how that raw savagery of the wilderness made you feel. I'd be fascinated to know. Because I'm I find I've got lots of them. Um, there's a tiny little baby nyala. And this is where of course these emotions change all the time. And there <laughs> is the newness of the acute little life. after what was nearly ended. And Penny Pine, you say it made you feel scared. Well, I think that's perfectly valid, entirely valid response to have. Around us, the orioles are calling. Spider hunting wasp, you can hear. You know, it flies around, looking for spiders to lay its eggs in. So, Deb, in Ohio, you picked up something here. The d hyena was so close, and you said, did I ever feel like it was going to jump onto the vehicle with the excitement? That hyena did think about it. It absolutely thought about it. It came When it came up to the right-hand side of the car here, and we couldn't see it anymore, and the dogs came up and cornered it against, it looked up onto the bonnet, and it, it made a very slight movement towards trying to kind of get on top of here, and then it looked at us and it decided, no, 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 and it went around the other side. Now, it would have been a, it would have been an absolutely terrifying experience. I don't think the dogs would have followed it, but it, I mean, I don't, it, I think it was touch and go with that thing jumping onto the bonnet to try and get away from those hyenas. Um, luckily, it's not a climber. I have had, I have had a leopard being set upon by wild dogs like that, and it did jump onto the car. And that was by far the most terrifying thing I ever experienced in the bush. And thankfully, it uh, left us alone. But yes, it can, absolutely it can. And Michelle Robinson, you say scared, excited, and amazed. And I think that's a pretty good uh, summary of what was happening there. Anyway, that's it from us today. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Joe. For your efforts. Brian, that's the thumb. How did the thumb feel, Brian? Uh, marvelous. The thumb really enjoyed that sighting, of course. Well done, thumb. The thumb was... And a big thanks to... <laughs>
A big thanks to Leanne and Nikki and Kirsty in the final control, and of course to Scott on the other vehicle, and he was being filmed by the inimitable Ian Dornbrook. To all of you, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions and comments throughout the morning, and we will see you this afternoon. We'll go and see how that hyena is doing, and until then, stay safe and happy wherever you are. We'll see you then. Bye bye.